There's loads of great stuff in this episode, but listen, before we get going, I would love it if you could subscribe, but as well as that, just hit the notification bell as well, because as soon as there's a new episode or something fresh from all of us, you will get it first. But for now, grab a pen and paper, because I think you might need to make some notes on this episode. It's full of brilliant takeaways. Enjoy. Here we go. Welcome to the High Performance Podcast. See you, Colisi. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to both of you. What an honor and a privilege to be uh, chatting to you guys. Well, uh, listen, the honor and the privilege is all ours, Sia. So let's yeah. start as we always do. In your mind, what is high performance? Um, to me, it's basically uh, performing like at the highest level for, um, of a consistency and continuously. And like or not only your body, not only physically, but mentally as well. And for me, the mental part is the most important part for me. I think you can be as best physically as, as, you, as you can be, but you can still, if your mind is not in it, you, you will never get anywhere in life. That's what I've realized the older I've got, that I play the game, I do everything in my mind, I'll prepare, I'll watch the videos and all that kind of stuff. Once I'm fit there, everything else just flows into it. And when I get in the game and I see all that stuff and my body moves because my mind is telling me where to go. So let's work out how you do that then, because there'll be people listening to this that like you can go to the gym and lift weights and the heavier the weights, the bigger the muscles, right? Yeah. It's much more difficult to get your brain into a place where it does what you want it to do. So what, what, do you remember when the first moment was that you realized the control that you have over your brain or what you need to do to, to get your brain into that kind of space? To be honest, only like late, like during the World Cup time, during that, the, the time that the new coaching stuff came, they made us, like the preparation that we did off the field, we trained more sitting in the computer room, especially when we go closer to the final, than on the field. I remember the last week, we had 90 minutes of training the whole week. They wow. said, you can't get any better anymore. Then nothing you can do can make you stronger. You've got a week left and all you, it's not going to make you better for the weekend. But we sat in the room and we watched clips of, uh, of England. We watched which, which, which foot this guy kicks off. How does it jump in the air? And then we watch all the plays. Then I see it over and over and over. Finally, when I get to the game, you see like whatever starter play they're doing, whatever is coming around the corner. I've seen this before. I know who's getting the ball, you know, and and all those kind of stuff. And it it changed it changed my mind. Like now, that's the amount of preparation I need to do to make sure that I make my best for the game. So can I ask a question then, to around um, a question that we ask a, a lot of our high-performing guests, which is how much of your success then do you attribute to your physical capability and how much do you attribute to the mental side of, of high performance? Um, it's tough because I think you, you, you have to be physically ready. There's no doubt about it. So the way that we train... We did every training that we did. We obviously have to have high speed running. Then they'll make us train that part of it. And then anything we did was to help us maybe lift the line out in exercise. So our body physically, I've never been in such, in such better shape. But I would say the mental role, the closer you get to the business end of the stuff, you know, when you get to the tough matches where it's just pressure, you actually fall back to everything that you've done before, especially mentally. You can see if you've done it over and I mean, we didn't even have to train our plays anymore because we've done it over and over. You're just preparing and reminding your body and like your mind is so strong. And, and as soon as that is strong, everything else follows, I think. And I think my mind was needed to be more prepared than the body. I'm so interested to see it, to work out where the mental strength came from for you then, because your childhood, you've spoken about how brutally tough it was using a brick as a ball, going to bed hungry, the violence that you saw around you making you afraid. I wonder whether the success that you've had as a rugby player and the ability to control yourself mentally now on the biggest sporting stage of all is, is not in spite of the fact that you came from a humble upbringing, but almost because of what you experienced as a child that gave you the resilience that you now use. Without a doubt. I think everything I experienced as a young, when I was young what well, it basically groomed me to the person that I am, you know, and all the struggles, all the stuff that I saw, 
like right now, like everything I stand for, everything I fight for is all because of what I saw when I was young, the struggle that I faced. I know there's many other kids and that's the reason why I put the chains on. That's the reason why I don't give up. That's the reason why I will fight for my position, you know, over and over and over again because I, I know it's not just for me or my family, with me or my dad and everyone else. It's everyone in the community. I can't do the work that I want to do if I give up, you know, and... I could have given up when I was young, but my grandmother always kept me positive, and that's what I I, I realized that I became more calm. Um, I became I'm smiling because there's some situation you can't change, but when it gets to a dark place where you're struggling and, and, and all of that, and what you said, Ella Damon Ubuntu, that's what got me going. That's why I fight each and every single day because without the people in my community, I wouldn't be where I am. And that is why I can't stop because if I stop them, that means that they're not getting a meal. Because that's what we're doing through the foundation. We are able to, 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 to donate to people and give meals and give bursaries and give people opportunities because, and only because people want to work with people who are successful. If I get dropped out of the team, I, or we didn't win the World Cup, I wouldn't be able to be here. So that, that is my drive. My struggle is my drive. Other people's struggle is my drive because I believe that I, I, can, I can make a difference with what I have with my platform. It doesn't matter if it's one or two people. At the end of the day, then they can change other people's lives. It's all about changing the narrative. So what lessons did you learn during those brutal early years here that when you're speaking to people now through your foundation that you tell them, uh, they can use to their advantage. Yeah, it's like things like being like, no matter what your circumstances are at the time, it doesn't mean, that doesn't determine where, where, where you're going, you know. Just because your parents are poor doesn't mean you're going to be poor. If you have dreams that you, like, you have to believe them in everything, you can, you have to believe them. You, your grandmother, your aunt, your, your uncle, your father, your mother, your friends, they don't have to believe, as long as you believe in it. And you gotta work, like, you gotta work each and every single day, like, for me, because the opportunity will come. That's what I realized. The opportunity will come, or it might not come, but some people doesn't come. But I prepared each and every single day by going to training. And when the opportunity came, I was ready when I got my bursary. And when I got my scholarship to another school in the township, then I got my trials to go to. I'd be training every day, not knowing that the opportunity will come, but I was prepared when it came. Most people complain and complain and complain. Opportunity presents itself and they're not ready. And that's where the difference is. And that every single time I've had an opportunity, I've been able to grab it with both hands because I've been preparing. And the way that my grandmother raised me, you know, you got to make use of what you have around you before you start complaining about what you don't have. You know, like I say, when I was a kid, I had a, a brick. I couldn't afford toys. I had a brick I used to drive. That was my car. I loved it more than anything else. I used to park it, I used to wash it, and everything. All the other kids had the Playstations and all that. I couldn't play. I still don't know how to play a PlayStation. I couldn't play it, but the way I enjoyed my brick, it made them upset. Like, they didn't understand why I had so much fun with this brick, because it's all I had. With the training fields we had, there were phones and everything. I used to train, and I, I, I would manage training and everything like that. And I still, you know, and I made it. And some people would say, we don't have a field. Our field is horrible. Use it. Someone will come and help you, and someone will come and give you. And I believe you get what you need whenever you you, you need it. Because we think we need a certain thing right now. No, you don't. Do what you do what you what you have in front of you at the time. That's what one of the biggest things that I've learned. I'm gonna use everything I I can. If I can't make it, then I'll go look for help because maybe this is not enough anymore. See, I'm fascinated to know what it was that your grandmother said to you, because the things that you've described there, <clears throat> a lot of them are things that you're unable to control. Yeah. Uh, where you were born, the fact that you lost your mother at an early age, the fact that the area that you were in suffered incredible amounts of violence and serious poverty. None of that was your fault, but at some point you still decided to make it your responsibility to deal with it and to live the life that you want. Can you remember the message that, your grandmother gave you that really resonated and made you realize that it doesn't matter. It's still Sia's responsibility to live the life that he wants. Yeah, I think I saw like where she was when she was looking up. Like she, she had no job. She, she, she had a job at the beginning. 
Then she lost her job. She was cleaning kitchens, you know, to try and put food on the table for me, you know. And and then she lost all the jobs. Then she would go from neighbor to neighbor, knocking on and asking. Like I would ask for for a cup of a cup of or mealy meal or rice for her to cook for me, you know. And she would go visit friends. They would give her a sandwich. She would put it in her pocket and drink a coffee and bring it home for me to eat. She would go days without eating as long as I had something in my wow. mouth, you know. But she was still smiling each and every single day. She was still showing me love, support, everything that I needed. And she gave me a time. And that satisfied, that was enough for me to keep me going as a child. And I would go to bed sometimes and I would be screaming. Man, my, my, my stomach would make noises. I would, I would tell, I can't sleep. She would make me sugar water. And she would tell me, trust me, drink this now, you'll be fine. And I would drink it, it fills you up for the moment. I wake up and I'm fine. I go to school, I get my sandwich. But the people that I would go to, to my neighbors, they would always give like a cup of, of, of rice or, or whatever. And I would eat. And I realized that without them, I don't think I would have made it. I don't think I would have survived. And those people are, are alive right now. There's actually videos. I don't know. I would try and get it and send it to you. Those same ladies, there's pictures that used to give to me. I went back now during COVID and I started donating because people were staying at home. They were reminding me. They were like, I thank God today that I gave a cup of, of, of mealy meal to you for your grandmother to cook for you because now you came back and you did more than that. You tripled and doubled everything that we gave to you. Wow. That is the reason why I do what I do. It's the reason why I wake up each and every single day. I don't give up. I don't quit because of them. Because without them, I wouldn't have made it. And that's why I take it upon my shoulders. I believe that's why I'm here. So that I can give back to the people that are coming after me. So their lives are much better than mine while they don't struggle like I did. See, uh, a mutual friend of ours, uh, I, I asked him to describe you to me. And he said that your greatest quality is that you treat everybody the same, whether it's a cleaner, whether it's a celebrity. He said, your greatest quality is the consistency of way, the way you treat them. In fact, he actually paid you a compliment. He said, you're the best hugger he's ever met in his life. So <laughs> it sounds to me like those it's qualities... Not during coronavirus, though, <laughs> yeah, <it>? No, sure. <laughs> but, but those qualities, to me, sound like that they were taught to you by your grandmother. So... I'm interested, what qualities do you look for in people to decide whether yeah. they're good people, whether you can help them or not? I, like you said, I think it's the way they treat me and how they treat the people with the restaurant, the, the, wait, the waiters, the waitresses. It, that, that's so important. I think a lot of people kind of forget the, the simple like manners, you know, and that's what I was told from a young age. And I still have the, that's what I still carry with me. Everything else disappears. I still take that with me. What I learned in school, getting up when an, an elderly walk in the room, morning ma'am, morning sir, and all those kind of things. And I treat people the way that I would want them to treat me. And that's what I speak, like what we speak at, at, my, at our foundation with my wife and the team. The way we help people during COVID, I think of myself like this. If I didn't make it in rugby, I would have been one of those people that were receiving the packages or whatever the donations were. And I always tell my team, I don't want us to help people the way I would want to, would have wanted to be helped as well. And it's the same as my kids. I treat, I treat people the way that I want my kids to see and they can, whatever I do, they must be able to do that as well. So I put that, that's the kind of thing. And I want people to always feel important when they see me. And sometimes I fail at it, you know. Sometimes it gets a lot. And I won't lie, I'm not perfect. It gets a lot. People want to fall today. And I've had a long day I'm with my family. And sometimes I, I, like, I can't deal with it. But I make sure, and of course it hits me when I treat someone badly because I've been a fan too of someone, you know, and if they say no to me, it hurts me a lot. I always go bad. So I always try and make everybody feel special. My teammates know when they come in, I hug, if the storm is now, I'm hugging them when they walk in because I don't know what they've been through. I don't know whether they need that hug a lot. And sometimes I need that hug and I give it to a person. I want people to feel that they connect with you. It can't just end with work. And that's about it. Because some people need this kind of stuff. And where I'm from, you know, we don't speak about emotions when I was young. I never heard my seen my dad cry. The only time I see him cry when he was fighting with someone, it was violence, all those kind of things. Now I want to change that narrative. I don't want to be living in that world as well. Men are just hardcore. All we do is 
get money, bring money home, buy food, and that's about it. We don't cry, we drink, and we do all those kind of things. The women do this. I'm trying to change the narrative that I grew up in because the world is different now. Because women work nowadays, women bring money home and all that kind of stuff. And men must also be vulnerable. Men must cry. Men must hug each other and tell each other they, they, they love each other. It's stuff that I grew up and I didn't get when I was young. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to to make it normal now for other people so they don't suffer like I, I do. So how often in the in the changing rooms, whether it's at your club or with the Springboks, do you talk to your teammates and your coaches about emotion, vulnerability, mental struggles? Because these are the things that in professional sport were not on the agenda even just a, one decade ago. Yeah, you see that I've only started like coming out really now since after the World Cup, especially like with gender-based violence, because I believe a whole lot of that starts with men not being not having a vulnerable place. Men talking to one another and not and having like an, an argument and it always ends up in a fight if you don't agree on something, you know. And my mother and my aunt were victims of gender-based violence. And my wife knows that. So she's been encouraged me, you have to speak up because men don't really speak up about gender-based violence. They most men say it's a woman's problem, but it's not we are the we are the perpetrators, we are the problem. Yeah, and we have to stand up and call each other out, especially us men that have seen so much of playing rugby with everything like that. So I started speaking now because, you know, with my voice, you know, it, it carries a lot of weight for yeah. especially young people, you know, and people around the world. And I want to make sure that I don't waste it. I use it for those who don't have a voice or those who are not heard. And some people might listen to me more than someone else. So I started using it. And now we, we talk in our team, you know, about a lot of this stuff with the Stormers. You know, we're going to be able to play internationally. It's a very important, like, just talking, like, to my teammate, uh, my teammate called Chris Fonzell. We sat around the fire the other day. I've known him for so many years, but we had a conversation at that fire that brought us so much closer. We spoke about deeper stuff, my family, what, like, what we're having right now, what I play for, what my motivation is, and, and what, what hurts me and what I don't like, you know. And it, it made me feel so good. It made me feel so much closer to him. And now, like, I'll do anything to play for that guy because I know what he stands for and he knows what I stand for, you know. And, and I think that's some stuff that we, we're missing as men, you know, those kind of conversations, especially in the sporting environment. So in that very macho um, sporting environment at the Stormers or with the Springboks sense here, what do you see the benefits to the team's performance by being more vulnerable and being more open about uh, emotions to be? I honestly think, like, if you tell me, if I get to know you as my teammate, far beyond the rugby field, what you stand for, what drives you, you know, some maybe your struggles, you know, what, things that have hurt you, like, it draws me closer, you know, and, like, why, and, like, what you motivate, what your why is, you know, then you, you can't, you, you understand the person himself. You are not the sportsman. You understand the person, why you do Because there's always a why on what you do. You don't just play to play. Some people play, play for money, but there's always something far deeper than that. And for me, like the more I know of you, the more I want to go out there and fight for you, you know. But I will still perform to my best, even if I don't know you, because you're obviously performing for your country and for your team. You get paid to do this. But like I'll get up at three o'clock in the morning if you call me and say you're in trouble, you know. It goes so much deeper than that and it brings you so much closer. And that's what I found out with my teammates, you know. Now myself and Chris, I call him at any time. Like I think about him, I meet him, like, I wonder how he's doing, how's his family going. And and that that makes it so much bigger than just on the field. Because sometimes you play with an amazing team and you never talk to each other again after you want something. And I don't like that. You know, I want that relationship, you know, to make sure that it's not just what's happening on the field. There's so much more in, in life. And you, you, you exist in a world of fine margins here. So let's say in the World Cup final against England, two very evenly matched teams going toe-to-toe. Do you think that one of the reasons why you won that and, and you have been a successful player is because you've created that relationship with your teammates that's more than just about rugby so that when you're really up against it when your back is against the wall when your face is covered in mud and you're tired you're pulling each other along you're a genuine band of brothers yeah i mean did you did you watch the the documentary 
Yeah. Did you like? Did you see how our coach knows us? Did you hear yes. him like? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is what like gets me going. When you speak to me, you don't speak to the sea of the rugby player. He speaks to me, to 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 my soul, to what I stand for, what what means so much to me. And when he spoke to us, like we playing for the country, like he never speak, he never speaks about. It. He knew us. I mean, he even told us like, I picked you because of this. He knows what I play for. I play for the kid in the township, so that I can change. Then he spoke when he spoke, played that final. When I got up, I'm like, okay, cool. And the stuff that was happening in our country with the gender-based violence, there were people dying. Like it was crazy. And he's reminded us like, this is what the country that we come from. But all of these struggles and problems make us so much stronger and we are not under pressure. We are actually privileged because we are playing. What we produce on that field can put a, a smile on someone, but it can change the whole country's mood. So, and like this, and it reminds you, if you think you're under pressure now, think about where you come from, how you didn't have food. It's only 80 minutes. You can change the narrative for the next kid. Who is in the same situation as you, but by you winning this, you can get all these like people working with you, and you can go back and change the narrative for the next couple of kids. So when he started speaking like that in the in, in that final game, it became far, it became personal because for me personally, for what I've played for, and then for us as a team, we were playing for South Africa. It wasn't about us anymore. It was about the country itself, the whole mood of the country. What could this this win do for us? And when he was finished talking, I, I was. I wasn't even thinking about losing that. To me, it was game over. Wow. So on a on 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 a more like say in domestic games and say that one of the paradoxes that I that I see when I observe you is that I know how humble and kind and decent you are, and yet when you play on that field, you're almost a different person. You know, you're there's like a controlled aggression or an anger that appears to drive you. So, how do you channel that on a um, on a on a weekly basis when you're playing for the Stormers and obviously for the Springboks? Yeah, it, well, it's 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 hard. Like like I like I said, I grew up around a lot of violence, and I really don't like violence anymore. Um, my wife always tells me she wonders what would happen if someone had to break in the house. I tell because she's like I'm too chill. Like she doesn't know. You know, I I used to fight a lot when I was young. Every weekend, when because I, I stayed in boarding school, and whenever I'd go back to the township, I'd go out. You know, some of the guys challenge you, you have to prove yourself that you haven't changed, you're not soft anymore. So I'd get into a lot of fights, and I would see violence at home between my dad and and my and my uncle, and then my someone hitting my aunt or my mom, and and shouting and screaming like doesn't really like work with me because it just brings back a lot of all those memories, all the stuff that I used to see. And now I've become more chilled. So when I get on the field, like I understand whatever I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing it. I'm not playing to hurt someone else or I'm not doing it to, I don't know, to be, to be ugly or anything like that. I'm just playing. I'm giving my best. I want to hit you as hard as I can with the shoulder, like in the right places yeah. because I respect you because I prepare for you and I want to give my best for you. And as soon as the whistle is, is blown and it's over and, then after that, I'm done. You know, I'm smiling, I'm greeting the guys, but there, there, there's nothing like vicious and ugly about it. I don't want to do do something to someone that it hurts them, that they don't play a game. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just want to face and make sure that my team wins. You know, I kind of control it that way, but obviously I make it personal. I don't want the, my opposite number to dominate me in the game, you know? So I, I always prepare and give my best to the field, but I make sure that it's as clean as possible. I never go in and try and hit someone's knee so he doesn't play again. So I, I make sure like when I'm thinking and I'm playing like that whatever I do, I'm, I'm, I'm make, like the other guy, I want to do something to someone that they, they would do to me. Like I don't want someone to come and try and hurt me all day long so I don't play again. Yeah. So how, Sia, do you protect what you've created? Because Sia Khaleesi, captain of the Springboks, um, runs an amazing foundation. That's all wonderful. But what if the teammates that are around you are not putting in the required effort to allow you to win. What if the coach isn't um, coaching you in a way that means you can be the best captain you can be? What if the, your colleagues at your foundation are not caring in the way that you do? You have to find a way 
to protect what you've created. So I'm, in, I'm interested. It's all been very f- kind and friendly and positive so far. What's Seal Khaleesi like with people that don't come up to step, don't come up to the standard that he requires? To be honest, I, I haven't been in a situation like that because the people that I have around me and the people that um, mentor me and guide me are all basically in the same mindset as I'm in, especially the people in the foundation. They, they all, they, they don't get paid, man. They all volunteer to, to work with the foundation. So we haven't got into a place where that has, that has been tested. And obviously my teammates, whoever I play, want to play with, we all want to be successful, you know? And I've always been fortunate enough to have coaches around me. Every not- teammate you've ever played with has come up to your standards, huh? That's quite remarkable. No. <laughs> I'm saying, I mean, I've been poor at times. I mean, I, I, I've yeah. had seasons where I've been horrible, you know? And, and, and yeah, you, you, you get, that's how it is in South Africa. That's what I've been like. You get dropped if you don't perform to to your standard but you only what you can do you just motivate one another because I've been there I know what it feels mm-hmm. like not to get chosen I know what it feels like to have a horrible season it's all about like making sure that you you to yourself do what you need to do you have, always have to look at yourself are you giving your best that's the most important thing I can't control what everybody else does you know but I know I can only lead when I'm doing my best on the field I can only lead I talk I, like, I don't like talking a lot you know a lot of people think I uh, this uh, inspirational speeches and stuff. I prefer playing as hard as I can, you know, and I can't control what my teammate does, but I can control what I say to him and how I treat him. But what he produces in the field, sometimes he's just having a horrible season. But there's nothing you can do about that. Everybody goes, goes through that. But yeah. that's why, like, any, like, when you have good, good and strong coaches around, they'll realize that and they'll see what they can do with players. Like, for me, before the World Cup, I was injured. I was really worried that my fitness wouldn't cope. I played against Argentina in the warm-up game, then we went to play against Japan. Played New Zealand, I felt so horrible when we lost that game. I was like, okay, I don't know if I want to make it. But the coach, put, he played me every single game because he said, my fitness will kick in and my form will come in. I must just keep on, I mustn't give up. By the third game, I was, by the third game, we played Italy. I played 80 minutes for the first time after that. Like, I knew, because the nice thing about Coach Rice, he's played before. So he knows what it takes. He's been in that role. So it's yeah. quite nice. But you are right. I have been with coaches who don't see eye to eye with me and who doesn't like the way they work. What can I do with that? Then I just, I try and be my best in what I do. And that's all I can do. I try and control what I can control. It's just be at my best. And sometimes, yeah, it doesn't work. I get dropped and and I sit on the turn on, on the touchline. I almost gave up the one time in the previous, like, previous World Cup. I never go to play. I play. Really? Like 30 minutes, yeah, I almost, yeah, I almost like, it was close. Like it was, it was tough for me. I never got chosen. I played like, my first game, I got my first cap. I got man of the match and then I was on the bench for the rest. I never played a game. In the, in How the, do you deal with that, Sia? Do you internalize it? Are there certain people that you speak to? Yeah, now there are. That time there wasn't. There was like, I just like, I didn't know what to do. I was like, this is like, what can I do? Like I was mm. working as hard as I could, you know? And yeah, but, some coaches maybe just they just don't rate you and, and and that's it. What what can you do about it? I had to keep on working, and then I started looking for contracts, uh, in like elsewhere in the world, and, and then yeah, I decided to stay. You know, and then I stayed. I pushed, and then I started getting more opportunities after that. So yeah, you mentioned that um, there's a perception that you as a captain will often be giving sort of inspirational speeches, and you'll be trying to motivate people. But I, I observed that you instead are a quiet leader. I heard you speak about that occasion when you were playing England and you were 20 points uh, down and you admitted that I don't know what to do here and you went and spoke to your teammates and asked, I, I asked them to speak instead. And that to me took real courage. But would you tell us a little, a little bit about that and also the benefits of, of your quiet leadership style yeah i think what i like about my leadership or about me it's not it's not actually my leadership that's just who i am i know what i don't know you know and i know what others around me have and i make sure i make full use of the people around me you don't have you can't you can't be everything at all times some people can who love to take ownership around themselves and make sure 
they say the last thing. I don't, I don't speak half of the time, man. I'm quiet because we have different leaders in our group, and sometimes you don't appeal to everyone. Some, like a different group of people, maybe responds more to this person. Let them be that, and that's how I do. Because I'm secure in myself. I know who I am and what I stand for and what type of leader I am. And I know my strong points too. Some guys know the game far more than me. Like a guy like Andre, he knows the game, he runs the game. And I was comfortable with that. And I'll go to him like, dude, I don't know what to do. What do you think we should do here? Like, don't worry, I got it. And a guy like Dwayne, he's amazing. Like with technical stuff with the forward. How do you get the guys going? I let them make, I, they, they chat. And, I, and that's what happened against England. It was my first time being captain for a Springbok team. And how I imagine is that we're going to come there and just destroy England. And England came in and started destroying us the first couple of minutes. And I freaked out, man. I just stood there and said, Dwayne, you speak. I don't know what to say anymore. Because I didn't want to act all strong and bold. And I'm like, no. I'm actually, I might even spoil this. And my teammate, teammates will never respect me. And I was like, you speak. And he spoke. And that's how things were. And the guys knew. They didn't. When something happened, they didn't go and look at me. We had different players who were in charge of different things, and that's what they used. And I wasn't scared of that. And I wasn't, I never felt, oh no, why am I not speaking? I'm not speaking. Like, no, I never felt. It's not about me. The most important thing is the team. And you must know what kind of leaders you have around you. Make full use of them. Make sure they work with you. Don't work against them at all. I think that's so interesting. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But, but what I find fascinating, Sir, is that I know that. There was criticism afterwards in the in the media about that, that people then started saying, well, who is the real captain uh, yeah. within this team? So how did you deal with that? Because the thing is, you <laughs> you must always remember, there's always been uh, people criticizing and all that kind of stuff. But I know what's happening. I don't care what everybody else thinks from the outside. If my teammates know what's happening, my coach knows what's happening, why, who should I impress on the outside? So I knew that, and I wanted to comment because I remember there was one time they were playing Wales, and uh, and Dwayne got the mic on the ear, and then that's why people started saying, "Okay, this guy is a real captain. Oh, who's the real captain here? Why is he talking to him?" But then it was a big thing on after the game on the media, but they didn't see that after that Dwayne went off because he couldn't go on anymore. That's what they were checking: can you go on? Right. But the people. I don't know if I if I now get involved in that and start speaking out, but I do get irritated because some people use that to start to start dividing the team or dividing things. But luckily, our coach is so on point that he was like, "Why should you listen to that? Focus here." And then we just focused on that, and we kept on moving. And they always fell away. All the critics, people that criticize, they just get tired and fall away anyway. And we kept on moving forward. And has that been a process, Sia, to get to a point where? you don't give credit to other people's external opinions or validation of you. Because I think we live in a world now with social media, 24 hour rolling news, there's critics everywhere. All of us seem to now be lured into caring what other people think. How, how did you get to a place where you're strong enough not to worry about that? Um, it's the people I have around me, to be quite honest. Um, um, Cause I used to, I was one of those people that I, w- I would know if I played well or not, co- uh, like by reading the comments on on yeah. the, uh, Instagram and all of that, and then like the coaches will tell you, the only people you have to impress is me and your teammates. That's the only people's respect that you need to gain. Mm-hmm. And then you start fading away. Then I started, I I went off social uh, Twitter. You know, I went off social media, and then I started just focusing on what my teammates were saying around me. And then you will have someone tell you played horrible, and then. You think you play horrible. Then I go watch the game. I'm like, actually, I played well. Look at all yeah. the things that I had to do. Because sometimes your role is different. You know, my, I used to run a lot with the ball. Then my role changed. Then I had to chase. I had to tackle. I had to do this kind of stuff. Other people don't see that, but my coach sees it. You know, I, you know. And then I sit there and like, actually, this how do these people don't know rugby more than everybody else in this room? You know, that's one of the things that the coach told us. The biggest, the quickest that, that you must listen to are right here. You are the best people in the country that are, are here to represent the country right now. Why should you listen to someone who's just sitting at home having yes. a few of a bride? Yes. People, these are the people that can solve your problem right <laughs> here. As Damien often says, Sia, don't buy a holiday from someone who's never travelled. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's not easy though. So do you go on social media now? And if you do, do you find it affects you negatively or do you avoid it? Uh, I try not to read, but I do read. Sometimes it does. Uh, it depends on what it is, you know, on the game. I know when I've played all when I'm when I've played badly, so I don't need somebody to tell me. So I don't really care much about that, but I don't go too much on it, especially when it's about rugby. I stay away, you know. Um, I, I normally focus mostly on the social issues happening happening around because there's so there's so much more important things than what you do on the field. You know, there's people dying each and every day. There's you know there's hungry people. There's people who don't have water. And I'm like, if I, I if I give my best at training and I give my best on the game and it doesn't go my way, hey, maybe it's not my day. You know. So. The foundation work that you do, Sia, is incredible. And the gender-based violence, uh, the way that you're speaking out about this is, uh, is, 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 is equally powerful. How do you deal with people that, uh, that are uncomfortable with you almost being a rugby player, stepping outside of your role and challenging bigger societal issues? You know what people are like, Sia? Stick to the game, stick to rugby. Yeah, you've heard it a million times, right? Yeah, I've heard it so much over and over. Remember, you're a human being before you before anything else, and and all of these, all of these um, issues are all like those are crimes against humanity. You know, if people don't have water, that's a crime against humanity. People should have water. People shouldn't be like raped in the street. People shouldn't leave uh, lose their children. I'm I'm a father. I don't want that to happen. I'm I'm, I'm a husband. I don't like I've got. I've got people that I care about. Like, I don't have to wait for them to be heard before I start speaking. I've got a voice, I've got a platform, and I've got to use it for good, not just for me. That's, a, that's another thing. Your platform is not, it's not mine. People gave me this platform. I know I worked as hard as I could, but without people supporting me, and I've got to be the voice for the people as well when they need me, you know? And if people tell me I'm, a, I'm not just a sportsman, I'm far more than that. I'm rubbish. I, I can be more than a sportsman. You can't bottle me and put me in, in a small bottle like that. That's not how, 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 how life is, you know. And I think I've seen so many sportsmen who've been able to, to do like so much and like what Marcus Rashford is doing in England. In, in, in. Well, that's what I respect him more than this because there will be better soccer players than, than he will be. Mm -hmm. But to me, he will remain in my heart. I will remain thinking about it. I will never forget what he's done because he's spoken to my story when I was a kid, when I wished I had someone like that. And that's what the person that I want to be. You can forget everything I achieved on the field because someone else will come and break all those records. Someone else will be the next uh, captain to, 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 to lift the trophy. But the work that you do then, the life that you touch, will remain for, for the end of time because the person that you touch will touch someone else, then you touch someone else, and that's how you change the world, and that's how you change what's happening around. So I have you must always speak a message of unity instead of division. Because a lot of people are trying to divide. People should work together. You know, in our country, there's a lot of social, a uh, lot of different social issues, you know. But people make us fight against each other because we're fighting for so different social issues. But we're not the enemy. The people in power, it's them that we're challenging. I can stand there with a the gender-based violence. You can stand there with a different board. There's no problem because we're not fighting each other. We're fighting the issue. The issue is the problem. And the, only the people that are in power that can make these changes. And that's why I hope that people can learn to understand that the person next to you is not your enemy. It's actually your ally because you both want this thing to end. And hopefully one day when all these issues have been fought, that we can all maybe one day fight for the same issue, you know, when we fought for all of the others, we can stand because there's nothing stronger than that. When people from different walks of life Different backgrounds, different races are standing together for one, like fighting for the same thing. Nothing beats that. But at the moment, we live in different worlds and we're all fighting for different things and we don't understand. And the conversation is what's needed. You need to talk to someone, you know. Me, I need to talk to you. You need to understand me, understand what my, my, my struggle is and I understand your struggle. And we can, you don't have to support it or stand it. You just understand, oh, this is why he's standing up for this, you know. Yeah. So when you lifted the Rugby World Cup above your head in 2019, Sia, was that important for you because it was a sporting achievement that you'd wanted to achieve all your life? Or was it important for you because of everything else that it represented? A black um, man from yeah. the project? Yeah? I think 
to like for 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 my being with my team for my rugby career. I I never dreamt. I never thought in a million years I would ever be be there. But what got to me the most is <laughs> my wife told me this. She said a lot of people dream about this stuff. You never you never dreamed of it because you didn't have the privilege of being able to dream like that. Because mm-hmm. doesn't with you, but. A lot of people dream about it, but they don't prepare for it when it happens. What are you gonna do? What, like she said, what are we gonna do when we win? And remember the night before, we wrote down the stuff that we wanna do. We wanna start our foundation. These are the challenges that we wanna tackle in our country. There's only one challenge we haven't we haven't done. We we said we wanted to build a, a model school school in the township with the boarding school. That's one thing that we haven't done. Everything else we wrote in that piece of paper because she believed that we were going to win, I also believe. And we're able to achieve all of those things because by lifting that World Cup, and I, I, like all this stuff that we do is not, without my teammates, there's no way I could have achieved this. And anything that I do, I always say, like, I thank those guys because this is part of their work. My coaches, my coaching staff, the physios, the medical team, the logistics, this is part of them, you know, because everything I, like, I think of, I'm like, these are the guys that helped me be here and and yeah and I always thought you know uh, it's great for the sporting but what I can do what we can do because we all have the same we all win we all are on the same level it's all about what you do with it and the amount of work we were able to do during COVID we started the foundation it wasn't even formed yet we didn't even have a name yet and we're already well helping buying a PPE buying um, food for people so we can help them stay at home because people lost jobs. And that touched me. And then I could travel during the lockdown. I traveled 16,000 kilometers around the country. And, you know, I, I thought people asked me how was lockdown. For me, it was flipping amazing from my family point of view. Um, and, yeah, it was tough not being able to play rugby. But when I saw how people lived, people without water, people with, like, there's a picture, I was, remember we were driving in Limpopo and it had just rained and we were driving over a puddle of water, a big puddle of water and we saw this lady with a baby on her back. She tied it on her back and she had buckets and she got some water from, from that water pond and there were dogs drinking from it and boys swimming from it. I asked her, what's the water for? And she said, it's to drink, it's to cook, it's to wash your clothes and to wash your body and all that. And that, and fortunately we were there so we did two boreholes, so they got water that day, and um, two boreholes, and we're donating food. So yeah, and I said then to myself, and I'm like, how how can I say I struggled? I had water when I was young, you know, and and I didn't eat every now and then. So what? There's people here who are facing so like so much worse than I did, and and I and I said to myself, I can never be satisfied with feeding one person or donating food somewhere or doing this here. There's so much more. I must be, the people that I'm helping, I must be telling them that when you get the opportunity, please help the next one. It has to be, it has to be like that. And for young kids, when I go speak now at Madrid, I tell them during this COVID time, you like especially the one that goes to private school or the, the model C schools, I tell them, you have computers, you have there's people who are the same age as you, 15 minutes away, who can't go to school anymore. This is their final year. They be losing out on so much, they might not be able to pass and make it to university. And this is the only opportunity they could have got to make it to university. So your responsibility right now is not to think about you and your family alone. Your responsibility is to think about what can you do for the people across the world? When you make it in life, what can you do to make sure that the next kid who's 15 years old doesn't struggle as much as the others, other kids struggle? So you gotta think more than about yourself because if you, Think just about you. It's easy to give up on yourself. It also helps you if you're putting someone else ahead of you because you can't give up anymore because you know there's so much more that you need to do. It's not just just you. That's why I play so hard because if I give up, my whole community suffers. You know, the people that we work with in the foundation suffer. So, yeah. So, yeah, I think one of the greatest gifts that you're giving through your foundation is, as well as all the physical help and support you're offering, is teaching people the power of having a dream, you know, and having ambition. So what advice would you give to anybody that is facing difficulties, facing tough times when it comes to having that dream and that ambition that things can be better? 
you are. Well, it's all about, um, yes. Because I'll tell you now, when I was in the township, when I was, when my grandma was still alive, I didn't think, I didn't imagine or think that I was going to make it out of there. That was in my mind. I was living in the moment. I was happy. I, just, I struggled financially. I struggled. I couldn't get food and all that stuff, but I was rich. I was happy. I had love for my grandmother. I had time. I had support. And that is all I needed at the time. You know, when I got a meal, I got a meal, you know. And I just focused on, on whatever I had. I used it as much as I could, you know. And then when I started getting opportunity, then I started dreaming a little bit. You know, I started, and that's what, what I realized in that period that I control my own happiness. You know, all this that I have now, it doesn't, I, I'm not, I was happier when I was poor. Can you, be, that's a, not a bad thing. I, I, I don't know how to put it. Like I had no stories about that. Obviously I'm grateful for all of this, makes my life better. But I, I was, I was more at peace. You know, I didn't expect much. And it's, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but I actually want to change people's lives so that they don't live like that because every, I believe every kid should get an, a fair opportunity in life. A kid sh- should get a fair opportunity from his own background, his own culture that they don't have to leave and go somewhere else and learn a whole new different language which was really hard, you know. And and just just have a dream, believe in it and work as hard as you can and don't let, like, like I said earlier, don't let family members or anybody who couldn't achieve their dreams or live their dreams tell you that you can't make it. You, you, you're the only person that can fight and believe in your dream and nobody will believe in your dream more than you do. And that's the most important thing. And that's what I try and tell my kids when they tell me they want to be a rugby player, I say, no, don't play rugby. It's too much in your body. <laughs> play another sport. You know, um, and, you know that, that's the thing. It, you, you just got to be willing to fight, man, with everything you can to, to, to make whatever it is that you want to be. For you to have captained the spring box, and then lifted the Rugby World Cup as a black man, lots of people would have gone, do you know what? I'm done. That's what I've achieved. What I think is incredible about your story is that the night before you did that, you chose to write down what you were going to achieve after you lifted the Rugby World Cup. And it's about what you're going to do, not what you have done. And that is, um, that's a very rare quality. Well, thank you so much. Now, I, 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 yeah, I think it's really, that's, you got to think, man, you, your life is like only a certain amount of time, and obviously you have to be successful in what you do. You gotta give your best. To my first, my first and foremost job is to play rugby and play rugby well. That's what pays for my kids' school fees and everybody else. But that's gonna end somewhere them along the line, and people will break all the records that you've broken. People will be better than you will ever be. There will be a new person with a new inspirational soul. What have you done in the field that you were? You had the platform. The time that we had the audience, that's emotional. And it's not even about me. It's about how many lives have I touched in that period of time. And I think that that's one thing I love about myself. I don't care much about me. It's all about the next person because the people that looked after me, like my grandmother would go days without eating. She didn't care much about herself. All she cared about is see her looked after. And that's what I've taken from her. And, and I was young. She died in my arms when I was... I think eight or nine years old. I mean, she looked after me and she died in my arms in the kitchen. I'll never forget the day. One of the saddest days ever, but one of the proudest days I'll ever remember with me because she raised me and looked after me and she was able to, like she died with me and I was able to say goodbye to the person that changed my life and made me the person that I am today. And it was hard because I was nine and I don't think I've registered what happened then. It's something that I still need to sort out and, and, and talk about. But... I find joy in that, that she chose to do it with me, you know, and that just made me so happy because I wish all of the, what I have now, I could, I could give to her and show to her and, and, and show her. I know she's looking down at me like I'm sure like everything you've taught me, I'm still here. I'm still standing. I didn't go to prison. I didn't do this. I'm alive and I'm doing well. I'm touching other people's lives and your friends that used to help you are now being helped because of you, because cause it's her because I'm here and obviously all the other people as well. I'm sure she's with you on the journey. Don't worry about that. Thank you so much, man. See ya. God bless and thanks very much for your time. See ya. Thank you. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community.
Thanks for being part of the adventure.